Here we go, we got the boat flipped over and I've started to clean up on the inside. Now this is really where your chickens come home to roost. All the stuff that you couldn't get at before while the boat was on the mole comes back to bite you. So it's really in your best interest to try and clean up as much as you can while you're doing the glue up because of course wet epoxy is much easier to clean up than cured epoxy. What I've been doing so far is I've just been going through the boat uh, first with a scraper and heat gun just cleaning up any major gobs of epoxy like some of these scarfs the epoxy is fairly heavy around them because of the way i was scarfing on the mold cleaning those up the odd seam where there's sort of a blob in there and i'm just trying to clean it down till the po to the point where it's sort of not uh smoothed out exactly but just no big obstructions and i'm also going through there with some sandpaper just 120 grit just hitting all the surfaces knocking down my little plastic nails which snap off and sand down very easily and one of the things that's really important to me right now is just making sure that all my plank edges don't have any sort of fiber sticking proud because I want to put a little fillet in all of these plank laps and I don't want some raggedy edge interrupting my tooling so that's really what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to clear the path for an easy tooling job. And sometimes that means pulling some of the epoxy out of the joint that's already there. I'm not worried about trying to get it like completely cleaned out, but just making sure that it isn't a proud glob of it. Fairing out these scarves as best I can. And I'm gonna be using some uh, fairing compound over top of these just to make sure they're nice and smooth before I'm done. In places where I've got scarves, I'm doing a little scraping too with just a cabinet scraper. And then back here in our tuck, I need to come up with some ideas about putting a little more structure into this joint. Mostly it's okay up until about here, but then it just sort of, it winds down to a fairly small little joint because it just becomes like, you know, a piece of plywood on edge, touching another piece of plywood on edge. Not a very substantial joint. Now, Paul Gartside has got a small dinghy in his uh, design lineup that has similar lines. Uh, what he's done is he's added a cleat onto the back side here, just basically beefing up the surface area around this joint. I think I'm going to do exactly that. It'll be like mm, just maybe like three eighths of an inch or something like that thick uh, by maybe uh, half an inch or three quarters of an inch wide. I'm not too sure yet. And we'll just glue it right on top of that lap right there beefing up this area back here. So it'll basically kind of like sandwich the edge of that piece of plywood. So that's my plan right now. And I really, I hate this stage. The, the stage where there's all sorts of globs of smeary looking glue on the surface of the hull and it just, it looks terrible to me and I can't stand it. It makes me feel like I really did a crap job um, of construction when I've got that stuff all over the place, but there's really nothing I can do about it. I just got to live with it. Um, when I'm when I have access to the surfaces, I can clean them off much much better, and they tend to look better. But uh, in this case, it's all going to be painted, so I'm just kind of gritting my teeth and working my way through it, and I cannot wait to get a coat of paint on here, basically. But before we do that, we're going to get into putting structure into the inside of the boat. We still need to chop down our shear to the to the gunnels, so that hasn't been done yet. We need to put a crown on our transom, of course, which. We'll probably get done near the end. As usual, I like to leave that towards the end of the job because in the meantime, I've got some structure that I can screw something to to steady up the whole boat and keep it from wagging around. We'll do the same thing with the stem, brace it off the ceiling. But for now, I'm gonna leave it the way it is. I'm actually even tipping the boat over on its side like so in order so that I can get down into the bottom of the hull here without uh, trying to bend over too hard because it does get just a little bit deep in spots where I can't quite reach it as easily as if it's tipped over. So that's what I'm doing. A whole lot of this. One more little thing that I do when I've got a big sort of repetitive job like this, break it down into sections. So all I'm doing is I'm concentrating on one station to the next station. And while this was on the mold, by the way, I traced where my station lines were on the inside of the planking so that I could keep track of that. And I've also punched a couple little holes into the planking underneath where the rub rail is going to be uh, or the in whales. And that's just to record where those stations are as well so that I don't lose those throughout the building process. And I've got some of those markings already on the keel 
uh, because I drew those on before fiberglassing and those are still there so we can make use of those. And um, beyond that, it's just keep going. Just keep going till it's done. What to do next is always like a big question. There's always so many different paths you can follow. And the question always goes through my mind is what's gonna be the most efficient path to follow. There's always a list of things, all of which somehow conflict with each other in terms of doing things quickly and efficiently. And uh, because we're using, you know, epoxies in this case, we have that setting time of the epoxy to consider. So once you apply it, is it a part that can uh, sit undisturbed while you do other things or is it such a situation where once you've applied the epoxy you have to just walk away and you can't touch the boat all these things go through my head what will I get done before the end of the day and often there's like something that I think I'm gonna get done one day and I don't get it done and I think I'll get it done the next day and I don't get it done and I think I'll get it done the next day and I still don't get it done and then I realize I shouldn't have been trying to even think about getting those things done so soon anyway. So today, my first thought was I keep thinking I, I really want to fill it these laps out because it's just sort of, it's a, it's like a major little piece of the puzzle. But I got to take care of a couple other things first. And so I've already decided I'm not going to try and fill it these out today. This is not going to happen. But what I am going to do is I'm going to deal with these laps back here at the tuck. Um, if we recall this, these two planks back here, as you hit the transom, it's just this little skinny butt joint that's only as thick as the planking itself, which is just a quarter inch. So it's a pretty weak little joint back in here. It's probably okay. And if you'd put a big hefty fillet on the outside, it would be just fine. I didn't do that because I wanted to sort of keep it sort of looking a little more traditional outside by not, not filling out the, these plank seams like that. So I'm gonna bulk it up on the inside I could just do fiberglass tape. I hate doing stuff like that. It just feels like I'm always going back to it over and over again, applying more epoxy, trying to fill out the weave and fill in little gaps and things like that. So I tend to shy away from slamming fiberglass on as a reinforcing material. I'm going to back it up with just sort of a wooden cleat. I decided to bevel off my plank edge and glue this down over top. I think I'm going to get a slightly stronger joint that way. It just exposes more surface of this plank and what it's basically doing is it's kind of it's putting a, a jog into this joint so that the plank that comes in butts into the garboard but then there's another piece that comes over top so it sort of creates almost like a like a lap joint if you will a half lap so i'm just going to use a piece of yellow cedar here now my first kick of the can was a total gong show um i I was trying to make it a bit too light. You started with stock that was too small. And then I started trying to match all the bevels in here. And uh, I played around with it for about half an hour. And then I just, I gave up because it was, I was chasing my tail and I knew when I was done, I would have this bit of wood in here that I didn't feel was quite substantial enough. Um, I mean, it would probably be okay, but regardless, it was just getting, getting ridiculous. So I chucked that and I uh, got a new piece of wood and I figured out how I want to shape it. And it's going to be this sort of weird trapezoidal shape when we're done. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to bevel off the edge of this plank to match the angle of this plank and just basically create essentially a flat plane upon which we'll put our, our cleat. I'm going to bring it right back to this frame station. And I'll just start by just whittling out a, uh, cutting a little line here to represent where we're going to stop the, uh, the cleat. And I'm just going to go square across for now. This is kind of a hard, it's hard to get a, a, any saw in and cut this angle properly. Okay. And now to to knock this off, I could actually use my saw. I could just come along here. In fact, let's try that right here at the start. Hey, 
There we go, finally. So I'll just bust that out of there and show you what I'm doing. So there we go, we're taking it down to the same bevel. I, I don't think I'm gonna keep going with the saw here. It doesn't feel super efficient. I was doing it with just a plane before and that felt a little more efficient. Getting it started back here at the transom is about the hardest place to do it, deal with it. I might even just try going in there with a chisel. I feel like I'm working at a physical disadvantage here every which way that's possible, to be honest. <laughs> Let's see if we can just knock the worst of it off with the plane with the chisel. What I'm worried about doing is overshooting and slamming my chisel into that stern post, putting a big gouge into it. I want one with a little more heft. Let's try to find another chisel. This is a big record chisel that I um, sort of slickified by taking off the original handle, putting on a new one, and I, I cranked the handle over just to give it a little bit more clearance. It's not like a true slick, and I almost, I'm tempted to even take this to the forge and bend it up properly, but I have not yet bothered to do that. Anyway, it's doing the job I needed to do, which is just sort of quickly knock off the bulk of stuff here. And then we'll come in with the plane to clean it all up. stern post here is really getting in my way of trying to sneak up on this joint here. We'll come back to that end of it in a bit.
All right. Just finish up with a little sanding. Here we go. This is a skewed Robert lock plane here. So the blade is skewed up to one side for one thing and then it comes out right to the side, edge of the uh, plane on the other side. I don't pull this thing out very often, but once in a while it comes in handy. Okay. So with that done, we can start marking out our stick. So the first thing we'll do is we'll just pull off the bevel of the transom here. We've got to basically break this down into a whole bunch of different little stages. So with that bevel taken off, this is the surface from there to there. This is the stick that's going to go on here like so. So we're just going to lay that off across the back. And I know this is going to dive in a little bit, so I just need the one line there. Now I need a bevel here, and uh, so the problem here is that with a, a bevel with a body, it's hard to get a good reading on of the transom because I can't touch the transom with this. So, uh, there's ways around that. We could put something against the transom like so, and then run this up, the blade up against it, try and pick that up. That's one way to do it. But this is where making yourself a little bevel square out of hacksaw blade or some thin sheet metal just like this can give me a more accurate result because it can just tuck up right close and it can pick up that bevel very easily. So just very carefully pick that up, we'll carry it across to here, find the other corner, oh, I've got it marked on the back side, and so there's our front bevel. And now we can take this angle we had before and we can add this to this side too. So that gives, oh, that's changed, that's changed, it got knocked. There we go, that's the correct bevel, right there. Okay, for all compound angles, just start on the corner, get the saw started, then adjust your blade until you're sighting right down it and seeing the saw hitting that line on both sides. My saw is grabbing, I think, because I, I probably have a tooth that's out of alignment. Yeah, ever so slightly. There we go. So there's our bevel. We'll just clean that up slightly. All right, that's good enough to go into the boat. Right now, in order to get this in position, the transom knee gets in the way. So I need to be able to get this up here and over to the edge of the plank to do my next operation. So to do that, I need to have a bit of a bevel cut onto the edge of this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull a bevel off of here to start with. And we're just going to add that to the corner for at least just a short section of the way along this corner here.
Okay, what I did is I just nipped out that uh, little angle right here on the bandsaw. There's a little bit of epoxy right in this corner. I'm just going to whittle out the corner here rather than fight it. I'm just trying to get a reasonable fit up against the transom. Okay, that looks okay. Need to lose a little bit of meat on the inside corner here too. Now that I have this tucked up where I want it, I just want to chop off my stick here at the location of the haunch. And it doesn't really matter what happens here. This is going to get a frame right in this place, so I'll, I'll be chopping away at this in some manner later on anyway. I just want to be able to squeeze it in there. So we'll just do a square cut right there like that. Okay, there we go. Well, that drops in. And so what I'm going to do is I'm sliding, I'm touching up here at the, uh, at the inside corner. And I'm sliding this corner down until it just just clears the uh, the bevel we've created there. So that's going to spring down into there. And there's a little bit of bounce to this here because it's going to have to get sprung into place. So with that position, what I want to do is I want to hold it in its final resting position as much as I can. And I'm going to reach underneath there. I'm going to just try and scribe along the bottom with a pencil here. Okay, there we go. Um, so we got this sort of funny sweeping line right here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the same bevel and I'm just going to carry it right through the whole length following this line. I'm just going to do that on the bandsaw since I've already got set up for this angle right here. Now I know this is not going to match this bevel all the way along, but I, I did it on the other side and it looks okay. It kind of changes, stick juts out a little bit down here, but it's the fastest, simplest way to sort of make this look good and have it do the job it needs to do. So over here at the workbench, I'm just going to try and clean this up with a block plane, I think. I'm being hyper conscious of the fact that if I slip with my fingers, I could slice my knuckles right open on this edge of this uh, cedar here. Doesn't seem like much, but it has happened to me many times before. Got a little turn in the grain here, that, which is messing me up. And that's not too bad. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to take my long board and just kind of give it a few swipes just to even things out a bit. Okay, that looks pretty good. We might have some small refinements after it's glued in place, I'm sure. So now the back side of this, I want to bevel this off too. And I've already set up the table saw with an arbitrary bevel that sort of leaves a little bit of meat on this edge and leaves, I don't know, about a quarter inch, three eighths of an inch on this edge. And that's just to lighten up the whole thing and also to keep water from collecting in this big corner here. So I can run a little fillet in here that'll help the water drain away.
Okay, there's a good reason I didn't use a push stick just there. And that's because the uh, throat of the saw here is wide open. I've got a larger um, throat plate to allow for the bevel. And I really should be using um, so like a tighter throat plate, but I, that's not what's in the saw at the moment. And so if I were using a push stick, I don't have much purchase that wouldn't want to try and shove the stick down the hole here, which would make it dangerous. So I was just very carefully letting the tabletop be my reference, pushing that along, putting the pressure here, and then switching over to here where I could put pressure on the table again to keep it from diving down in, and then very carefully inched it along to finish off that cut. Now that that's done, I'm going to take a block plan and I'm just going to clean up this surface to get rid of the saw marks, and then this is ready to go in. It is a difficult thing to hang on to, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drop this stop into my bench here. So this is uh, something I don't use this often enough. Um, got a little dowel at one end of this, and I got a hole in the edge of my bench here, and this hole is intended for sticking lamps into, but I just found this works pretty good. And uh, of course, just a little cleat that fits in the vise here, so it's tailor-made to fit this spot. And it gives me a, like a full width planing stop, which works really nicely. So I'm just going to drop some pegs into the holes here to hold the back edge of this, so i got some resistance this way. Yeah, darn it. The grain turns on me a little bit there. I have to work backhanded, which is no fun. There we go, that's good enough. Okay, we'll drop that into the boat now and see how she looks. All right, so there we go, that slides up there. It's down into place and that fits really quite nicely. Great. So when I glue this in, we'll of course use thickened epoxy and I think I'll probably use some plastic nails to help tack it in place and try and get this bend happening. And when I fit a frame later on, I'll worry about beveling off the, the, the tail end to sort of match whatever uh, shape I need back there. It's easy enough to trim that back. Okay, that's great. It's one little glob of epoxy right there holding me up. Much better, much better. What I'll do um, just right now actually is I'll drop that in place. I'm just gonna throw a pencil line on here just to remind myself where I need to apply unthickened epoxy for the wet out. Now just go doctor this one up a few strokes and we're ready to go. Okay, I'm just using a little bit of Total Boats Total Fair here to just fair out where these scarves are. It's a nice even layer across these areas. I decided to do this now because I realized that when I'm fairing out these uh, these spots, it's my long board is more likely to gouge into any fillets that I've got along here and screw that up. So I thought better to just get them on now. Get those fared out and then the fillets will be easy. This little, little divot there. The trick I find here is to have enough material on the squeegee to start with, and, and of course you don't want it overhanging your ends where it leaves a big glob. And then we 
got to kind of press hard to get it to make sure it's bonding and try and get a nice even coat you know that spans across the area that you figure needs fairing so i keep delivering a fresh bead of compound onto the trowel here and try and keep it a little bit away from the the very ends So, so far this uh, Total Fair has been working pretty good. I've got another product, a br different brand called All Fair, which is made by All Grip, which also works just fine. So I'm just worried about the major scars. There's tons of little pinholes here. We'll come back and deal with those later on. Come on, I don't have quite enough compound on the, the trowel here to get a good squeege. Holes. There we go. Nope. Ugh. I'm just hitting a few pinholes while I've got the little extra left behind. That's not enough to do a scarf. I should really be more systematic about this, I think, but I'm not being systematic about it. Okay, well, um, so yesterday I filled all the little little pin holes, about a bazillion of them here on the inside. I guess that is the downside with using the polymer nailer. One disappointment with the nailer is when I was first made aware of it, the salesman who presented the, the product, if you will, he implied that these polymer nails would like melt on their way into the material and they would stand a little bit flush on the outside. You just had to sand them off. And I've not found that to be the case. They tend to sink themselves into the material a bit. And if I suppose I could adjust the pressure on my compressor, but I really wish they had an adjustment on the gun itself so that you could dial in the depth of the nail head like they do on a lot of other nailers. That would be really convenient. Anyhow, that aside, um, they do sometimes blow a slightly bigger hole than you would like on the inside of the veneer. You know, not in most cases they come through pretty clean, but in some cases they knock out a little chip which is not great, but uh, I knew that was going to be the case, and so I anticipated it, and um, it's really not that big a deal to do a bit of this patchwork here. If you're doing a bright finished boat, of course, you'd probably not want to use the nailer for sure. You'd want to just go with clamps, or maybe just use um, steel brads or something like that, something where you can extract that pin very very carefully and, and leave a smaller hole. Anyhow, uh, I'm on to sanding. And you know, I have often sort of touted how great these Durablock long boards are. And they are, I've gotten a lot of use out of them. I, I, the one downside is the, the PSA backed paper doesn't hang on to them as well as it could. But you can get ones that have hook and loop uh, on them. In fact, when you buy them factory made hook, with hook and loop, they just have hook and loop glued onto the rubber. So you can do that yourself if you wanted to. Uh, and I think that put the hook side on the block the loop side is on the paper, but I've just always gone with the uh, self-adhesive. So all the puttying in here, we used uh, Total Boats Total Fair for that. And that's a two-part 50-50 putty. One's yellow, one's blue. You mix them together, you get green. Uh, I really quite like this stuff. It's got a nice consistency. It sands out pretty easily. It's not like drywall compound or anything, but uh, 
I'm quite happy with the ease with which it sands out for the most part. It's a bit like Bondo. Let's call it maybe it's just a little bit harder than Bondo. If nothing else, it's just it's very convenient and it is epoxy based, unlike Bondo. So this will hang on to bare wood nicely, uh, whereas Bondo, yeah, it will, but it's not intended because it's polyester based. Polyesters don't hang on to wood super great, which is why in your fiberglass boats you tend to have these engine uh, these engine bed stringers and transoms that delaminate from the rest of the boat because <laughs> those two just don't go well together. You still need the 24 hours curing time on this stuff. So there's that inconvenience. What you can do if you have little spots that you'd like to be able to hit with Bondo, you get a coat of paint on it first and then you come at it with your Bondo to touch up here and there. You know, I have often sort of touted how great these Durablock long boards are and they are. I've gotten a lot of use out of them. I, I, the one downside is the, the PSA backed paper doesn't hang on to them as well as it could but you can get ones that have hook and loop uh, on them. In fact, when you buy them factory made hook, with hook and loop, they just have hook and loop glued onto the rubber. So you could do that yourself if you wanted to. Uh, and I think they put the hook side on the block, the loop side is on the paper, but I've just always gone with the uh, self-adhesive. These work great on the outsides of things because they're fairly stiff, but they're just flexible enough to conform to the outside of these boat shapes pretty nicely. However, when it comes to the inside, I find that they're just a little too stiff for conforming to the inside of the planking in the way I would like it to. I went to go get a shorter block earlier today, figuring I would just switch to a shorter block. Um, but then I'm sitting at the store and I'm looking at the blocks and, and it's like 30 bucks for, you know, a block half this length. And I'm like, oh, I'm just not feeling it, if you know what I mean. So uh, then I remembered I have a local plastics place that has a LARPing supply section. <laughs> so I went in there and for 50 bucks, I got this big ass block of the same material, EVA foam. Actually, this one is just a slightly softer durometer than the Durablock. Durometer is the word we use for defining foam density. And so it's still pretty dense. I would say it's like 20% softer or something like that. And so I've just peeled off some chunks to make my own dura blocks and I just made some different lengths here and they're just that that little bit that's softer enough that they're conforming to the inside really easily um, and they'll be fine for doing the outside too so I've basically now got like an, a, a lifetime supply of of these sanding blocks uh, so that's kind of cool you got to be super careful trying to cut this stuff on a table saw dodgy dodgy I'll tell you that much it really likes to bind easily. Use a, you want to use a saw with a, a generous kerf on it, I think. that, Or maybe you use a really thin saw. I don't know which. I was using a ripping blade and it did not like that. But we got through without it blowing apart or throwing itself across the room. I was shocked, however, when I bought a new box of these, this body file paper at the price tag on that. And that was like, oh, 125 bucks for a box of 50 or something. So that hurt. But I get a lot of use out of them. Um, you know, I don't like spending that kind of money on abrasives, but it is good stuff. It lasts for a pretty good length of time. And uh, there's nothing quite the same. It doesn't Using regular sandpaper doesn't last nearly as long. So I think in the end, I'd probably, it probably equals out in terms of how much life I get out of this. And this stuff works great on epoxies. Okay, so I'm gonna keep going with sanding out the other side. And uh, by the time I'm done this little process, I'm going to be ready to do all of the laps here. And I decided to get some um, West System 610 in caulking tubes for doing this. And the reason I decided to do that is because I was doing a little bit of filleting on those, those uh, backing cleats back there. And I was reminded that as much as using a piping bag is great for a small section of stuff, when it comes to this volume, it's kind of a pain and I could mix up my own in a cotton tube but I was thinking I might just go with the 610 go with fast and easy um, and save on time and just get this done because I want to move on to the framing okay I got uh, 
pile of sanding in my next hour of existence. So uh, I'm gonna mask up and get right down to it. 